I have been thinking for a long time what I wanted to do as far as showing my love for my ancestors' stories and their culture. So I thought first about where would I start. And, as any good story, I would start at the beginning. In the earliest days, there was no sand, nor sea, no soothing waves, nor was the earth there. The sky was blank and chaos reigned, no grass to touch. In this empty space called Ginnungagap was nothing, but north of it was Niflheim, a land of cold and dark, and at the center of all was the well called Velgirmir, the source of all the water in existence, with the twelve great streams of Elvivagr frozen as soon as they left the source. South of that chasm was a land of fire, Muspelheim. It was the home of the fire Jotun and their ruler, Surtur, an eternal being that brandished a great sword of fire and had complete control of this destructive and life-giving element. He kept ward at Muspelheim's gate, and sparks from his sword would hiss as they hit the ice of Elvivagr. All this heat created mist that would again form into frost, and from that the second creature of Gnungagap came to be. Ymir sometimes called Orgulmir, was a creation of frost, and all his descendants were known as Frostjotun. As he came into being, he moved around in the dark and dank world around him, groping for something to eat. In the darkness he found the ancient cow, Eudhumla, also known as Nurisha, the mother of all cattle. Ymir found that from her udders flowed four streams of milk, and he could finally stem his hunger and thirst. Audhumla also wanted nourishment, so she sought out the ice blocks all around them and started to lick the salty ice of the sea. After a while of licking, she uncovered the hair of Bude, the first god, also known as the producer. Ymir had after his meal of milk fallen asleep, dreaming of what this world might become. While he was sleeping, three creatures came to be. From his armpits he sweated out his son and daughter, and his feet produced Thrugdelmir, the six-headed Jotun, who in turn gave birth to Birgelmir, and from these two the Frost Jotun traced their ancestry. The Jotun became aware of the presence of Bure and his son Bor, who was born short after his father. They attacked them, waging war on the gods over the realm. There was no hope of peace, for their ways were so different. This struggle lasted for eons, one side never overcoming the other, and thus stalemate reigned in Gnunagagap. Then Bor married the Frost Jotun Besla, the daughter of Boltorn. This couple produced three powerful beings, Odin, Vili, and Ve. The brothers joined their father in the war against the Jotun, their mother's kin. They killed the oldest Jotun, Ymir, to end the war, and the other Jotun drowned in the blood of Ymir, apart from Bergelmer, who escaped to Jotunheim at the rim of existence. 
he set up his kingdom there, and many of his children would continue the war against the Esir, the gods of Norse mythology. Since the gods now had triumphed over their foes and banished them to the outskirts, they started to regard the desolate landscape around them. They found that they wanted to improve it. So Odin, Vili, and Ve started to use the body of Ymir to create the world. The corpse was pushed into the chasm. Ymir's flesh was used to create Midgard, the world of humans. Though it was empty for now, the eyebrows became the bulwarks to protect the land against the blood of Ymir. Blood and sweat formed the oceans around Midgard. The bones formed the hills and mountains, cliffs created from his teeth, and finally his curly locks became the forest and vegetation of the world. The gods then lifted the skull of Ymir up and formed the sky. Out of the rotten flesh of Ymir stepped a stout group of creatures, the dwarves. They popped out of the ground, and many of them were fully formed. The four strongest were Nordri, Sudri, Austri, and Westri. They were given the task of upholding the sky, and they stand there even to this day, guiding sailors and travelers alike. The gods then thought that the world was too dark, so they looked at the only light in the world, Muspelheim. They caught the sparks of fire that Sutur threw out with his sword and created the stars in the sky. But the two biggest sparks they stole and fashioned two grand chariots. Those two sparks were the sun and the moon. Two steeds were chosen, Arvakar, the early riser, and Alsvin, the rapid mover. They were chosen to drag the chariot with the sun. In fear of the heat killing the steeds, the gods decided to shield it with skins, ice, and a shield called Svalin, fashioned to be cool to the touch. They then placed all this in between the sun and the steeds. The moon chariot was given the steed Alsvidr, the fastest steed in all of creation. But the moon was not as strong as the sun, so the gods decided that no protection was needed. Then they needed drivers for the chariots. The gods sought out the Jotun Mundilfari, the one who moved with the seasons. He had recently had two children who he had named after the two brilliant spheres for their beauty, Sul and Mani. If it was a punishment for heresy or an honor is not known, but those two were chosen and the god took them by force and placed them to ride the chariots across Ymir's skull. Not, the daughter of Norvi and the goddess of night, was given the horse Rimfaxi. She rides it during the night, and from the mane of Rimfaxi, a light sprinkling of frost and dew is spread. Her movement also spreads the cold of the night, Three times was not married. First time was to Naglafari. Not much is known about him, but they had a son, called Aud. Then Not married Anar, a dwarf stout and strong. For him she bore the daughter named Jord. But then she met the Esir, Dellinger, also known as the Dawn and with him she had her last child, a radiant son named Dagger. 
His beauty was such that even the guards were in awe, and they gave him the steed, Skinfoxy, and with it Dagger spreads joy and light wherever he went. All was not good, though, because two wolves had been lurking in the darkness, Skull or Hearty. They saw the good created by the gods and decided to destroy it. The hate was especially strong against Sul and Mani, because they had illuminated what was their realm of darkness. Skull or Hati chased them across the sky and occasionally the wolves would catch them. When the wolves caught them, the gods and the creatures of existence would be terrified, but they would make so much noise that the wolves would drop them and Sol and Mani would escape. Mani had two companions, Yuki and Bill. They had been rescued from their evil father who had made them carry water all night, and when Mani saw this he took pity on the children and allowed them to accompany him every night, easing their burdens. The gods did not only want day and night to define existence, so they gave new gods new areas of responsibility to symbolize their strengths. To mark the turning of the seasons, summer and winter were made the rulers of seasons. Evening, midnight, morning, forenoon, noon, and afternoon were all helping Sul, Mani, Dagger, and Nott to complete their godly duties. Summer and winter hated each other and were therefore placed in charge of different times of the year. Winter was allied with Resvelger, the corpse swallower was dressed in an eagle's mane, and when he flexed his wings, a cold and icy wind would sweep down from the north. This would signal the coming of King Winter, and he would rule instead of the gentle King Summer. First, I need to make one thing clear. This is the story that I grew up with. This is the creation myth that I know of. And there may be many other versions as well. We have lost so much of Norse myths and legends that it is hard to piece together an entirety. I can imagine this story being told in the dark halls of homesteads around Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and Iceland, all the way back to the migration period, or maybe even earlier. We don't really know when this story started, or what culture first told it in the elements it has we do not, in fact, have the complete stories themselves. This presentation has been gathered from various poems and texts surviving from the Norse age. Snorri Storlason and several others have glimpses of how the Norse and also the pre-Norse cultures viewed their world but we do not really have the complete view of it and we also do not know if this has somehow been tainted by Christianity or modernity but this is what we have so this is what I have to work from the Norse creation myth does start in the same way as a lot of other Indo-European and other cultural creation myths do, with a void and a darkness. But there is a hint of either something existing before it, or that this is a new beginning. 
Hati and Shlo, the two wolves representing hate and loathing, seem to pop out of nowhere. But they also seem to have existed already, that they are older than any of the gods. Even the elements, in the form of fire and ice, is presumed to have always been there. And this is very interesting, because it means that you can almost see a cyclical nature in the Norse myths. Fire and ice are two very important elements in Norse mythology. It does come up a few times in the creation myth and also in the end of time's myth, Ragnarok, which I will deal with at, at a later stage. An important part of Ragnarok is Finbulvinter, which illustrates how the Norse thought of ice, snow, and the cold, it would kill you. It is very understandable when you take into consideration where it developed, not its origin, but its final development, where I live, in the north of Europe, in the Nordic countries. You must develop an early appreciation of the elements surrounding you. Ice and snow could kill you if you do not respect its effects on you. But you also know that it can be life-saving with the right elements, in this case, fire in the form of Sutur Solord. You can create life-giving water represented as mist. This in turn creates the first creature in the Norse mythology in the form of the Jotun or Etten, Ymir. Now the Jotun are a strange but often common people. They seem here to be a kind of proto-culture, as they are not portrayed as stupid or directly evil, but more driven by their base nature than the later Esir. In fact, the name I just mentioned, Etin, has its roots in the verb for consuming in most Germanic languages, to eat in English, Essen in German, and Oete in Norwegian, my mother tongue. Though they are often translated into giants by most English-speaking authors or retellers of Norse myths, there is very little evidence that they were in fact greater in size than humans, or at least the Esir. Their name seemed to have more in common with the great consumer. Not the modern day meaning, but it could perhaps be something that the environmental movement could take to heart. Don't be a Jotun. Don't consume without thought. The realm of Jotunheim or Utgard is often portrayed as a wasteland. Now the question is if this is because they were driven to a less fertile area of the world by the Esir, or if they did in fact consume everything around them and through that became known as those who would consume everything. And having the Esir looking on them in somewhat of disgust at the grand waste of resources that they represented. It has been said that the Jotun are somehow representations of the other, those outside of the group. And yes, that might be part of it, but I would hesitate to absolutely say that this is the case. Many ideologues connected to the far to far right groups like Vigrid in in Norway and um, the Nordic uh, resistance movement and so on uh, have throughout time pointed to people outside of my culture and used the word Jotun as an example of something other, something that we should not let into our midst. There is no evidence of the Norse thinking of anything in the form of race. But this is also wrong in my opinion. As the creation myth shows, Odin and his brothers were born of a Jotun woman who was accepted by the gods. And as later stories will show, there was nothing stopping a Jotun to become a member of the Esir. 
Tyr, the general of the Ein Harjers, being a perfect example of exactly that. This is why I do think that there's more of a way of thinking than some ethnical connection. The Jotun were the baser parts of humanity, no matter their race. Now, that is my minor rant about Jotuns done. We can now move on to more fascinating topics. The gods. The first god was the god Buri. He was quickly followed by a son, Bor. They come out of the elements directly like Ymir, while the Jotun are born from the armpits of Ymir. I have no idea why the armpits, but that's hence they came. It might be that this is a connection to water and ice, just like their kin, fire Jotuns, are connected to fire, but that would be jumping to conclusions. Buri isn't born, but more uncovered by Audhumla, who also seems like Hati and Skull to have appeared out of nowhere. Uh, maybe some sort of sign of an eternal presence. It's almost like the god has been there waiting for something, living to uncover him. His name is also very interesting. It means producer or father, and he is the forefather of most of the gods in the Norse pantheon. He is, however, not eternal, because at some point he just disappears from the stories. This is another part of the frustration with only having 10% of the Norse myths available. Audhumla is also connected to the ancient European culture reliance on cattle, a lot of the other cultures that derive from it seems to have placed cattle in a, a central role, especially the Hindu religion. Another mysterious being is Buri's son, Bor, which means being born. Now, he is born, but by who or what is not known. And it happens instantly after the appearance of Buri. So you would think that either Buri gives birth to him, or he is some sort of product of Buri and some unknown female entity, whether it's Audhumla or the daughter of Ymir, who can tell. With the emergence of Buri and Bur, the appearance of Thrudgelmir and other Jotun conflict almost seems inevitable. As I mentioned earlier, these are two cultures that see the world in very different manners one that wants to consume all around them, and another who seem more willing to harvest the surplus that nature produces. This will cause friction, and it does seem to rage on forever until the ice mel melts and all but one Jotun is drowned. This is another example of flood myths being prevalent in ancient this flood is only mentioned in regards to this war, uh, but it is interesting that it also seems to appear in other Indo-European myths and that it's connected to ice. A lot of theories can be drawn from this, and there are a lot of people claiming that all these stories are, co uh, are a collective memory of a massive flood, or perhaps several. There are even evidence of uh, a culture disappearing in the Black Sea, around where the Indo-European tribes may have roamed in the ancient past. There's evidence of uh, settlements and also freshwater fish, skeletons of freshwater fish in the depths of the Black Sea. This war is also reminiscent of the war between the Titans and Olympians in Greek myth. In Greek mythologies, there are several of these wars as the Titans originally also toppled their ancestors. So it does give a feeling of these stories being about ancient revolutions, in a sense. Children of a culture revolting because they have been held at the bottom of society, and for them to become the oppressors. 
as we see in future stories in Norse mythologies, there is very much a cyclical trend in Indo-European myths. One generation of gods or a strong mythic figure being toppled by their younger and more energetic offspring, sometimes in cooperation with members of the older gods. The Jotun do in fact become intertwined with the gods in some sense with Bor Mering Besla, a frost Jotun. This union produces the most famous of offsprings, Odin the Allfather. Odin, Vili and Ve, his two siblings, are three very interesting characters. Odin being the godhead of Norse mythology, but also a very different type of godhead uh, in the Indo-European sense. His name has been thought to mean spirit or mad one, uh, both in a sense of anger and insane. He does things that seem contrary to what you would think of in a patriarchal society. Later in the stories, we will discover him dabbling in Saidr, the art of divination, uh, something that was considered the realm of female magic. Um, you could even connect this to the ancient characters of the Norns, who seem to have knowledge of how long a person's life is, even the life of a god. Willy and Ve, his two brothers, are no less interesting, though perhaps less is known about them. There is a story that I will cover later when Odin goes in search of the ultimate warrior in Midgard, and this leads to Willy and Ve becoming stewards of Valhalla and chaos ensuing. Uh, their names means Will, Willy, and holy there. That trio of virtues do seem to matter a great deal in Norse culture, spirit, will, and holiness. After the death of Ymir at the hands of that trio, something that could be seen as the virtues of spirit, will, and holiness overcoming thoughtless consumption, if you subscribe to the idea that I do, about the Jotun and the gods, the gods decide to use the corpse of that great Jotun to create the world. This is a very common feature in Indo-European myths, or at least that Uranus, for example, is the embodiment of the sky. In fact, in reconstructed Indo-European mythology, the sky father is the major godhead of that religion. This event of creating the world from the corpse of the old culture can be the idea that even if someone supplants another culture, parts of it will survive. In fact, Odin is, after all, half Jotun. This, in turn, could also be why any hu human could become a Jotun, someone who will carelessly destroy all around him and consume more than is needed, or an Aesir person driven by will, spirit, and holiness. A fact that can be seen in the Norse feasts that are often a reenactment of the eternal feast that occurs in Valhalla. Odin also has a manner of advice to people that can be read as advice never to overdo the feasting. Odin represents the balance between the two, and this will be clearer as we move along further down the path of the Norse stories. I hope you have enjoyed this little story time and analysis, and that you want me to continue making them. You can support me via Patreon or Coffee. links are in the description. Remember to like and subscribe to my channel. And next time, we will cover the worlds in Norse mythology, as well as the dwarves and elves. Until then, fare thee well.